Uh, it's interesting to note, Mr Speaker, that uh, nobody, particularly on the SNP benches, wants to actually listen to the uh, debate, uh, which is surprising, really, because it was exposed on the second reading that they actually didn't know what was in the Istanbul Convention when it actually came to it. So you'd think that they'd learn their lesson and actually want to learn about actually what was in the Istanbul Convention this time round, uh, but, uh, but apparently not. I, I, I'm not entirely sure whether the... Uh, kneeling position of the honourable gentleman opposite uh, is in order uh, during a, a speech for the honourable member for Perth and North Perth's uh, position on his knees facing the wrong way. I'm not entirely sure whether that is in order, but um, it's certainly not. It's certainly not normal. Uh, it's certainly not normal behaviour from the uh, from the from the honourable the honourable gentleman. He, he may not be listening, but he could at least give the impression that he's interested in knowing what's going on in the uh, in the uh, debate. He, he's, he's not. He's not. We're very clear. We're very grateful to him for clarifying. He's not interested in the uh, in the debate. Uh, there's, there's, there's no wonder the SNP is so authoritarian. The Istanbul Convention uh, has a two-pillar monitoring system that accompanies it, ensuring that all members are living up to their commitments. And the aim of, uh, of this in the Convention, it states that it's to assess and improve the implementation of the Convention by the parties. So we have these two groups, uh, Grievio, which is initially composed of 10 members and will be subsequently be enlarged to 15 members following the 25th country to ratify it, and a political body, the Committee of the Parties, which is composed of representatives of the parties of the Istanbul Convention. Now, it seems to me that the last thing that we need here is another group from a supranational body set up to, look, to make it look as if they're doing something uh, on issues, but just becomes a talking shop, when actually it's not the implementation of the Istanbul Convention which will actually make any real difference to levels of violence uh, generally, and certainly levels of violence against women, uh, it's harsher sentencing of perpetrators that will make a, a big difference. The idea that having these group of experts uh, pontificating about how well or badly something's been implemented will make any material difference to the uh, levels of uh, violence uh, in the UK is for the birds. Uh, what I would say is, and I think this is very important to put on the record, I think it shows that in Sweden, Portugal and Poland, they clearly take this issue very seriously. Uh, and I commend them for doing so uh, and actually laying bare uh, to me what their figures were. In, in, in some cases, those figures are, are, are very good. In some cases, those figures are not so good. But they've been open and transparent enough to share them with me and I've been able to share them with the House. What I do worry about, Mr Speaker... Uh, is the countries that didn't share those figures. And I, and I do fear that the reason why some of the countries didn't reply with the figures is because, uh, and I've got no evidence to support this, I'm making an assertion that I, I appreciate can be countered. But I would fear, and my suspicion may well be, that the reason why the other countries haven't supplied the information is because they may be slightly embarrassed that the figures have gone in the wrong way since they ratified the convention. They're not aware um, of the argument. And, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but I, I could be wrong. People can draw their own, can draw their own uh, conclusions. We've also had figures through from Albania and uh, Austria. Um, and again, in Albania, the figures show a, a, an increase uh, from their time of ratification from 4,599 to 5,281. Uh, and in Austria, again, the trend is the same. Uh, their first annual report came out in September last year, after the convention came into force in 2014, and it showed that the number of female victims of those violent offences had increased again from 37,546 to 37,677. So I think it's fair to say that we're not going to make a massive amount of difference to levels of violence against women by ratifying this treaty. I should also say that in Austria, the, the number of women murdered in Austria, since they ratified the Istanbul Convention, the number of women murdered went from 118 in 2014 to 165 in 2015, which seems to me quite a significant increase in murders against women in the year after they ratified the Istanbul Convention. And so it seems to me, Mr. Speaker, that it's absolutely essential. This is why I think new clause. Well, 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 yes, of course. Uh, on, that, on that point, yeah, does he think that that increase in the number of murders of women is just because there's been a higher reporting rate? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I suspect it's harder for uh, a murder victim to report that particular crime, uh, but cle uh, so clearly not. My old friend is, uh, is absolutely right. It can't be explained away by increased, increased reporting of uh, a crime. I think it's fair to say that uh, murders are known to the public authorities. Um, and so that is, a, that is a considerable increase in murders in the one year since they ratified the Convention. And so I hope all of those people who are claiming that this is going to lead to a miraculous reduction in violence against women will now change their mind. And perhaps they might be persuaded to vote for new Clause 11, which would mean that we would have all of these statistics available to us so we could produce our own analysis, whatever that might be. What has anybody got to fear from knowing what the facts are around all the countries who have ratified the Convention? Uh, I don't really see what anyone would have to fear from asking the government to source that information. I, I think w w what I would say is that just not, not sign up to any particular article doesn't mean to say that you disagree with what's in there. It just means that you want to retain sovereignty for your own uh, country. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, well, following on from that, uh, can my Prevent understand why it was that the last Labour government, when they were negotiating uh, this convention, were prepared to allow um, other countries uh, merely to have non-criminal sanctions <coughs> in respect of stalking uh, and to allow a reservation of this nature in relation to stalking when uh, there are only a very limited number of reservations allowed. Well, my honourable friend makes a very good point. Uh, it makes a very, very good point and no doubt the, uh, the, 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 the Labour spokesman will be able to explain to the House why they think it's absolutely fine for other countries to have non-criminal sanctions for stalking um, and for psychological violence against, against women. They, they, they obviously agreed to that being part of the convention. Um, and people are happy for us to sign up to this convention as being a gold standard for protecting women. Uh, well, I hope people realise what's in this gold standard for protecting women. They, those people who uh, campaign the most vociferously seem to be the ones who have read the least amount of it. I, I always there's a direct correlation that the people who, have, who seem to be the most wound up about it are the ones who have read it the least. Um, and um, if, if some of them take the time to actually read what's in the convention, they may be shocked as to what's in this gold standard. Uh, I actually think that the UK can do uh, a damn sight better than what's in the Istanbul Convention. Uh, and uh, actually, I think that we will be actually levelling things downwards by signing up to the Convention rather than actually levelling things upwards, which is what we should be seeking to do. If the government wanted to do something useful around the world, actually what it should be saying is that they should be encouraging other countries to adopt the same practices that we adopt in this country, rather than actually us agreeing to adopt the same things that they do in those countries, which are much weaker in terms of dealing with violent uh, crime uh, and particularly violence against women. So uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The Labour Party have a great deal to answer for in this debate about why they think uh, stalking should be a non criminal sanction in other countries and psychological violence against women should be a non-criminal sanction and maybe the promoter of the bill will be able to explain why she ado uh, would adopt that uh, policy uh, as well. I, I suspect it's not one that she uh, tells people about uh, very often when talking about the Istanbul Convention. Uh, and, you know, I, I have to say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that men are nearly twice as likely to be the victim of a violent crime as women. 1.3% uh, of women interviewed for the crime survey reported being victims of violence in 2014-15, compared with 2.4% of men. Uh, when it comes to the most serious of cases, according to the crime survey for England and Wales, women accounted for 36 of recorded homicide victims uh, um, in 2015-16, uh, in whereas men were 64% of homicide victims. And yet, uh, so far, the only provisions... Uh, we have here apply to women and, I, and I'm, I therefore think it's important that the government makes clear what provisions they have for the victims of violent crime, uh, uh, whether they be men uh, or women. And uh, I, I hope that the government will agree to publish that information and, and, and if not, to explain why it's, it objects to it so much. <coughs> Amendment 50, uh, <coughs> Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, Again, page 2, clause 3, this is the next uh, bit about the report to show what they're doing to promote international cooperation 
against these forms of violence. Uh, and, uh, and, and after that, I I've inserted at the end of all that that they should also provide the statistics showing international comparisons on the levels of violence against women and men. And I spoke earlier, I, I don't intend to repeat myself, I spoke earlier about the information that I've managed to acquire from different ambassadors. But again, I think um, if we actually ask the government to, to show what they're doing, and then we ask them to show what other countries who have ratified the convention are doing, it gives us a good idea as to how we can compare how we are doing in this country against what other countries are doing. Surely that is a meaningful comparison that we would want to be looking at. At the moment, there are no meaningful comparisons that the government can offer us to say how we're doing compared to how other countries are doing. And I don't know why it would be afraid of doing that. Surely it would want to be making sure it was doing better than other countries. And my uh, uh, um, amendment here would allow it the opportunity uh, to do that and to, and to highlight um, its, its record against other countries and maybe bring each other up to the highest possible level, to level everybody's standards upwards rather than them being just done at the lowest possible um, common denominator. Will my honourable friend give way? Uh, yes, I, I will give way. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does my honourable friend uh, see any irony in the fact that uh, whilst um, he and I have proposed uh, deleting um, as a result of separate amendments A, B, C and D, the government have actually proposed uh, deleting sub clause E, which is the one uh, which is the most substantive one of all the uh, sub paragraphs to this clause. Well, my honourable friend is right. Yeah. And, and, and actually, Mr. S Mr Deputy Speaker, what's happening here, if, uh, if anybody would bother to notice, is that I'm actually <coughs> strengthening uh, the, the paragraph E. I'm actually trying to give the government more requirements for reporting what they're doing the post ratification. Uh, and I'll come on to the government amendments a, a, a bit later, but it, my honourable friend is right in what he's saying, is that while I'm, with these amendments, strengthening paragraph E, making sure that the government has to give more information, the government, with the SNP's connivance, yes. with the SNP's connivance, are actually making sure that there will be no reporting post-ratification of the Istanbul Convention on any of these issues, on any of it. Um, uh, but again, they will have to explain uh, themselves uh, on that. But I, I think it's, if we are going to ratify this convention, we should at least have some post-ratification knowledge of what, the, what on earth is happening and how well we're doing. Now, as for the government amendments, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, which, uh, which the SNP have endorsed, uh, let's not forget that, um, these are quite extraordinary. Quite extraordinary. Um, I'm opposed to this convention, I've made that clear, but this cosy deal shows that they don't really care too much about it either. Uh, they pretend, they, I, I'm going to resist the temptation to give way to my own for now, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I, as I indicated earlier. So, uh, I, just to show that I do, I do take notice of, um, of, of, the, of the chair, as always. Um, <clears throat> the, really, they're attempting to fillet this bill uh, without anybody noticing oh, it, yeah. <laughs> claiming to be uh, champions of the Istanbul Convention, whilst allowing the government of the hook ever to actually have to implement it. Uh, these are all about making sure that uh, the, either the uh, Istanbul Commission is never ratified or <laughs> is delayed as much as possible in terms of the ratification. And why on earth the SNP have agreed to this? Only they will be able to uh, explain. Perhaps they're so embarrassed about it they won't even be willing to explain it at all, Mr Deputy Speaker. But I hope they'll have the guts to admit to what they've done. Uh, but new, the Government's Clause 1 removes the ratification of the Convention on Violence Against Women, uh, it, it, which would impose a duty on the government to take all reasonable steps as soon as reasonably practical to enable the U United Kingdom to become compliant with the Istanbul Convention. So uh, the government wants to delete that, it wants to leave out Clause 1, which actually, the whole, the whole point of the bill is Clause 1 of the bill, it's to, to cover the ratification and to impose a duty on the government to take all reasonable steps as soon as possible for the United Kingdom to be compliant with the Istanbul Convention and the government's removed that from the bill and the SNP are happy for them to remove it from the bill. Absolutely extraordinary stuff, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. You, you, literally, you literally couldn't make it up. And finally, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've re in many respects, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've, I've saved the best till last. 
Here we go. I've saved, I've saved the best till last. Oh, yes, don't worry, you're going to hear it in all its glory. Government Amendment 16, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and with it 17, but 16 is an absolute perler, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I have to say it myself. Basically, it actually, it actually not only, it's not only have they taken out Clause 1 of the bill, which actually is the whole point of the bill, it's so bad they've even had to change the title of the bill, because the title is no longer applicable to what the government are prepared to sign themselves up to, uh, with SNP support. With SNP support. They've actually, the, the title of the bill actually says at the, at the start, it says at the start of the bill, it's a bill to require the United Kingdom to ratify the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, the Istanbul Convention, and for connected purposes. I think that's what everybody outside of this place thinks, that the whole bill is that's what we're debating today. That it's a bill to require the United Kingdom to ratify the Istanbul Convention. Well, not anymore, Mr Deputy Speaker. <laughs> not anymore. The government and the SNP have caved in on actually what this whole bill was supposed to be about. Because now they've changed that. They're leaving out the requirement of the United Kingdom to ratify. It is no longer in the title of the bill if the government and the SNP get their way. It would just make provision in connection with the ratification <laughs> by the United Kingdom of. I.e., let's kick this one into the long grass. Doesn't have, we'll just have a few things that need to be done before we actually ratify it. It doesn't actually any longer require the government to ratify the Istanbul Convention, and it's even removed connected purposes <laughs> as well, just to, just to, so we can't even, nothing that might actually help ratify the yeah. Istanbul Convention that's not in the bill can also be included. So there we have it, Mr Deputy Speaker, a whole range of amendments, uh, some of mine I, I hope are about transparency, some are actually to strengthen the measures that are expected of the bill. They're certainly to so that people know what has to be reported on and so we can see what's happening in other countries as well. On the other hand, we have the government amendments. We are supported by the SNP, watering down the bill, in fact even removing the requirement to ratify the Istanbul Convention. The public outside need to know they have been conned by people who claim to be supporting this, claim to be on the campaign group to, to ratify it, and they've been really sold up. At least some of us are honest about the fact we don't like this convention and I think that that has got to be a better way to operate than this rather shabby deal that's been done between the government and the SNP. But we'll t I will hope we can test the will of the House on the weakening of the convention and we'll see how we get on in that, Mr Deputy Speaker. But I beg to move new floor six.